Thailand's constitutional court removes Prime Minister Sreta Tavisian from office. And eligible Hong Kong senior residents can use the elderly health care voucher to pay for services at three more Shenzhen medical institutions. Hello and welcome to TVB News. Thailand plunged into political turmoil today after a court removed Prime Minister Sreta Tavisin from office because of an ethical violation. The case for which the Constitutional Court Judge Sreta involved his appointment of a cabinet member who had been imprisoned over an alleged attempt to bribe a court official. The court voted 5-4 against Sreta and the ruling removed him from office immediately. Nasvi Karim has more. He was meant to be the unifying force for a civilian government trying to unshackle itself from military influence. But Sreta Tavasin is now on the same scrap heap of Thailand's constitutional court that issued verdicts to remove three prime ministers before him over 16 years. The court dismissed real estate tycoon Sreta after less than a year in charge for appointing to his cabinet a former lawyer who had served jail time. It said the appointment violated the constitution because the minister did not meet ethical standards. The move comes a week after the same court dissolved the progressive and hugely popular Move Forward Party because of its campaign to reform a law against insulting the monarchy. Sreta's removal may also affect the political comeback ambitions of ally and former Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawatch, who last year returned home after 15 years of self-exile. His return was seen as a fragile truce with the conservatives and military elite that previously unseated him. Sreta's dismissal revolves around his appointment of Shinawatch's former lawyer, Pichit Chunban, who was briefly imprisoned for contempt of court in 2008 over an alleged attempt to bribe court staff. The bribery allegation was never proven and Pichit resigned in May. Deputy Premier Puntam Wachayochai is expected to take over as caretaker prime minister, with Sreta's Per Thai party still seen as having enough influence to lead the next government. Among the options is Thaksin's 37-year-old daughter, Pe Tong Tan Shinawat. Thai rules state that the next leader must have been nominated by their party as a candidate for prime minister before the 2023 elections. If successful, she would become the third Shinawatra to lead the country after Thaksin and her aunt, Yingluck. Nazvi Karim, TVB News. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida has announced that he would step down as the ruling party leader, ending his three-year term that has been dogged by political scandals and rising prices. Japan is expected to see a new prime minister this fall, and former Defense Minister Shigeru Ishiba has emerged as one of the major contenders. Danny Cho has more. Kishida told a press conference today that he would not seek re-election as president of the Liberal Democratic Party, or LDP, next month. This came at a time when the cabinet suffered months of record low approval ratings at around 20 percent in the wake of the party's corruption scandal. Claiming full responsibility for the scandal, Kishida decided to step aside to press for a change. He said, we must continue with political funds reform and restore public trust in politics. Kishida, who took office in 2021, is the eighth longest serving leader of Japan after World War II. In his announcement, Kishida highlighted his efforts to promote wage hikes and investment growth in a bid to let Japan fully emerge from deflation. But the failure of wages to keep track with the rising cost of living has led to public discontent. On foreign policy and security, Kishida stuck to a hawkish posture and unveiled the largest military buildup in post-war Japan by doubling defense spending and reorganizing the forces. Meanwhile, he played a key role in mending Japan's relationship with South Korea, which enabled the two countries to invigorate their military alliance with the United States. Last year, his administration pushed the discharge of nuclear-contaminated wastewater from the crippled Fukushima Daiichi plant into the Pacific Ocean which triggered strong opposition from both home and abroad. The revelation of the LDP's ties to the controversial Unification Church was another blow to Kishida's popularity. Kishida's three-year term will expire this September. In the upcoming presidential election of the LDP, the 67-year-old Shigeru Ishiba took the lead in public opinion poll. In recent weeks, Ishiba endorsed the Bank of Japan's normalization of monetary policy and advocated measures including boosting domestic demand to spur growth rather than relying on foreign trade. 
The 44-year-old Shinjiro Koizumi trailed behind Ishiba. As the son of former Prime Minister Junichiro Koizumi, he studied at Columbia University and was appointed Environment Minister in 2019. He is a proponent of renewable energy and has formed an image of a reformer. Minister of Economic Security Sanaita Kaichi is also deemed as a promising contender. She won her first seat as a House of Representatives member in 1993 and was credited for passing legislation to create a clearance system for economic security. Meanwhile, as a staunch right-wing nationalist, Takaichi faced criticisms from China and South Korea for her visits to the Yasukuni Shrine. Danny Zhou, TVB News. Huawei is close to introducing a high-level computer chip for artificial intelligence use. According to a Wall Street Journal report, it's said to be comparable to a top chip by NVIDIA, the H100, which is not available in China due to U.S. sanctions. The new Huawei chip is named the 910C, which will be launched in September. It is expected to be a technological breakthrough by Huawei. Hong Kong lawmaker William Wong, an academic in computer science and an expert in Chinese computing, said the Huawei chip needs to undergo repeated user application testing before mass production. Wong added that if the chip operates with OpenAI, it could have wider applications. Eligible senior citizens in Hong Kong can now use the elderly health care voucher for certain services at three more Shenzhen medical institutions. Some Hong Kong residents arrived at the designated institutions early this morning. Mimo Singai reports. The Shenzhen New Frontier United Family Hospital is one of the three newly listed medical institutions where eligible senior citizens are allowed to use the elderly health care voucher to pay for certain health care services. The scheme covers services provided by designated departments of the hospitals, including the general outpatient clinic, internal medicine department, surgical department, dental department, gynecology department, orthopedics department and ophthalmology department. This elderly couple came to the hospital for eye-checking service. There was a quota of 10 patients on the first day. The man said he had visited the hospital many times and is satisfied with the service. The hospital also has advanced equipment, so we decided to come here today to use the health care voucher, he said. The original outpatient fee for ophthalmologic service is 1,100 yuan. Now, by using the elderly health care voucher, it costs only 299 yuan. Shenzhen CKJ Somatological Hospital is another institution where the voucher can be used. This man who visited the hospital said the dental fee is much lower in Shenzhen than in Hong Kong. Meanwhile, the Dental Bohemia Speciality Service Center said they had received more calls from Hong Kong senior citizens in the past week than before, asking about using the elderly health care voucher for services. Deputy Secretary for Health at the Lee said the scheme involves government expenditure and authorities will closely monitor the progress of the program. Lee stressed that the medical service quality of the institutions under the pilot scheme is at a reasonable standard. News 9, TVB News. Oxfam Hong Kong said it suffered a cyber attack in July and has reported the incident to the Office of the Privacy Commissioner for Personal Data. The charity said more than 470,000 people could be affected in last month's data leakage after its computer system was hacked. The Office of the Privacy Commissioner for Personal Data has launched an investigation but said the number of people affected has yet to be confirmed. The government is in talks with the MTR over the land use around the future Pak Shekok station on the East Rail Line. Furthermore, there could be changes to the development density of residential flats. Mimo Singai reports. The area of Pak Shekok near the Science Park is currently used mainly for medium density residential property, but it could change. In 2022, the government said in a policy address that an MTR station will be built in Park Shenkok, while 10,000 residential housing units will be built in the surrounding areas. The nearby Education University will release the land on its sports ground to build the station, which is expected to be completed by 2033. In the latest 
update from the Development Bureau, it said it is discussing the future station with the MTR with a view of releasing the potential of lingering areas. Currently, the number of housing plans to be constructed is 10,000, while community facilities will also be built. A real estate expert said two pieces of land near the future station has been set aside for median density housing, so there is a high chance it could be changed to a high density residential development. Meanwhile, Lu Hufeng, a Taipo district councillor, expressed concern about delays in the construction of the new station as there are only nine years left until 2033. Numus 9, TVB News. Still ahead. Ukraine keeps pounding the Russian border region of Kursk with missiles and drones. Joe Biden says he's not giving up hope on a ceasefire in the Middle East. And a sneak peek at the Food Expo at the Convention and Exhibition Center. Welcome back. Ukraine kept pounding the Russian border region of Kursk with missiles and drones on Wednesday. Russia's air defenses destroyed 117 drones and four tactical missiles launched overnight by Ukraine that targeted several regions, including Kursk. This, as Kiev said, it had made further territorial gains into Russia, an incursion that the U.S. President Joe Biden called a real dilemma for the Kremlin leader. Tracy Furness has more. Ukrainian military vehicles on the move near the Russian-Ukrainian border. Russian military units that included fresh reserves, aircraft, drone teams and artillery forces stopped Ukrainian armored mobile groups from moving deeper into Russia near the cursed settlements of Obshi, Kolodes, Nagos, Kalchuk and Alexievsky. Ukrainian foreign ministry said the cross-border operation was aimed at protecting Ukrainian land from long-range strikes launched from Kursk and was not interested in taking Russian territory. However, in a briefing with Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky, the country's commander-in-chief of the armed forces said, in the past 24 hours, Ukrainian troops had advanced, gaining control over 40 square kilometers of territory. As of today, 74 settlements are under our control. Fights are ongoing along the entire front line, he said. Ukraine's account has jarred with Russia's assertions that Kyiv troops had been halted and attacks repelled 28 kilometers from the border. U.S. President Joe Biden said he is in constant contact with the Ukrainians. What do you have to say about what's happening in Russia and Ukraine? Have you spoken with anyone in the Ukrainian government? I've spoken with my staff on a regular basis, probably every four or five hours for the last six or eight days. And uh, it's, uh, it's creating a real dilemma for Putin. And uh, I've, we've been in direct contact, constant contact with the, with the Ukrainians. That's all I'm going to say about it while it's active. OK? Tracy Furness, TVB News. The Middle East is on tenterhooks as Iran considers its response to Israel over last month's assassination of Hamas political leader Ismail Haniyeh in Tehran. Israel is being blamed for the killing in Tehran, though it has not claimed responsibility nor denied it. Tensions continue to rise with Iran's Yemeni ally, the Houthis, attacking a Liberian-flagged oil tanker in the Red Sea, while the U.S. hopes a ceasefire deal between Israel and Hamas could convince Iran to refrain from attacking Israel. Nazvi Karim with more. Israel's Iron Dome defense system intercepting drones fired by Lebanon's Hezbollah group into Israeli territory. It's an almost daily routine, but both sides know the firepower in the skies above Israel and elsewhere in the Middle East could explode dramatically in an instant. This as the region awaits Iran's expected response to the July 31st assassination in Tehran of Ismail Haniya, the political leader of Palestinian group Hamas. Iran reportedly conducted a military drill in the north of the country on the Caspian Sea. Its new president, Massoud Pazeskian, has rebuffed a joint call from France, Germany and Britain to exercise restraint, saying it would lack political logic. Reports say only a ceasefire in Gaza, where around 40,000 Palestinians have been killed since October 7th, would convince Iran to stand down, at least for now. 
the U.S. is encouraging Israel and Hamas to accept a ceasefire deal. It is mediating along with Qatar and Egypt. No one benefits from any kind of retaliation, and what we've been engaged on uh, is intensive diplomacy with allies and partners um, who uh, are helping us communicate that message uh, to the region, um, uh, including directly to uh, Iran. Uh, we're also communicating this message directly uh, to Israel and uh, also reiterating that our commitment to Israel's security is ironclad and will continue to defend Israel against attacks from Iran and Iran-backed terrorist groups. This ironclad support means the moving of U.S. hardware to the region. The Pentagon has ordered aircraft carrier USS Abraham Lincoln, guided missile submarine USS Georgia, and F-22 fighter jets to the Middle East, where they join carrier USS Theodore Roosevelt. U.S. President Joe Biden, speaking on his arrival in Los Angeles, said he is not giving up hope on a ceasefire. Hard. We'll see what you. We'll see what Iran does, and we'll see what happens if there's any attack. But I'm not giving up. Pazeshkian said a punitive response to an aggressor is the right of nations and a solution for stopping crimes and aggression. Adding that Israel had paved the way for severe punishment on itself. Nazri Karim, TVB News. Back locally, starting tomorrow, students can register for a digital Octopus card on their mobile phones via an online platform. The MTR said the digital octopus will be available to students who have met certain requirements. After completing the registration office uh, registration process, they will receive an email displaying information on how to access the digital octopus card on their mobile phones, upon which the digital payment method will become operational immediately. The MTR said the entire registration process could be shortened to around a week. Residents can try out delicacies from around the world at the Food Expo, organized by the Hong Kong Trade Development Council, starting tomorrow for five consecutive days. The event will be held at the Hong Kong Convention and Exhibition Center. Some exhibitors said they will offer special discounts to counter the effects of the trend of residents traveling up north to shop. Timothy Lee tells us more. Stalls set up by exhibitors from across the globe are wrapping up their preparation work for the opening of the HKTDC Food Expo. Hoping to attract visitors, many venues will continue the trend of offering the popular $1 discount for canned abalone. Many exhibitors said they wish that more Hong Kongers would choose to shop in the city by organizing fun activities and discounted food items. The HKTDC noted that this year's Food Expo will include a new section dedicated to halal food, which means food permissible for Muslims, owing to the recent rise in business opportunities between Hong Kong and Islamic countries. Meanwhile, some participants from abroad stress they will like the opportunity to break into food markets traditionally dominated by the Chinese. When people say birdness, it's maybe they mean they mainly think about Chinese, right? But Indonesia uh, is the, has the best environment to produce bird nest as well. So for our bird nest is, of course, it's halal. It's a still a new market for us. We are very interested um, to be uh, more uh, present uh, in the Asian market. Poland is, uh, at least in Europe, uh, known as a kind of agriculture powerhouse. We have very strong and uh, dynamic develop uh, food processing. Uh, so uh, we are pretty good at uh, poultry uh, products, dairy products, like gems, like uh, juices. The event will also feature a food tech section displaying innovative creations such as this 3D printer capable of printing an entire meal. It's a digital 3D food fabrication with a very user-friendly interface. So what we can do is we can customize a lot of food textures, appearances, and even nutrients. For example, embedding vitamins or even Chinese medicine. So we, right now we are targeting to a lot of special dietary needs patients. The company behind the technology added they plan to expand its reach to create customized foods for the city's athletes who just returned from the Paris Olympic Games. Users of this 3D printer can make many food items, ranging from mooncakes to gingerbread cookies and even soft meals for the elderly. The company that introduced this technology to the city said the printer's primary function is to cater to the individual's nutritional needs and concentrate all nutritional ingredients into one single item. Timothy Lee, TV News. That's the news. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.